Uh, welcome uh, to another episode of uh, Crime Pays, but Botany does and I. Uh, as you can see today, I'm on a beautiful Chicago River, uh, and it'll always be the Sears Tower uh, in the minds of anybody who grew up here in Crook County. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'm here in the Chicago River, and you can see uh, what we're looking at right here is some sort of bioswale uh, activity and construction that was uh, recently put together. Now, the first time we recognized what was going on here, we were actually you know, going down a river in a little kayak we'd rented, you know, to, to cleanse the spiritual palate, you know, make us feel less like puking uh, when we're uh, within the uh, boundaries of human infrastructure. But we noticed what they got going on. They got a, a native uh, aquatic little garden here, uh, you know, right across from the waste management uh, uh, treatment plant, you know, the garbage plant, the shit plant, and uh, all the other, uh, you know, uh, decrepit remnants of industry. And so, you know, this was, this, this made me feel pretty good as uh, this kind of stuff tends to do to any human being you know a, a, a sparkling light amongst the amongst the the smell of the shit you know figuratively and literally speaking so let's go check out what they're doing down here now of course most of the trees you're going to encounter on a river are going to be european invasives okay or asiatic invasives you got morris alba uh this is actually a native right here we got uh, our asian agundo box elder a Siberian elm, okay, which is a pretty weedy tree. It seems just growing right out the uh, steel retention wall. So, uh, you know, most of the stuff, oh, we got a vitus. That might even be a native vitus, native grape. Wouldn't eat the grapes, though. Of course, we got, you know, the tree notorious for smelling like goat piss, the tree of heaven, Ilanthus altissima, Simarubaceae, okay, brought the, the United States in the late 1700s for silk moth production, then escaped, and now it's everywhere. But it's especially prominent in places with summer rain okay uh, anyway and right here we got a cool native uh, Celtis occidentalis which is in the cannabis family cannabaceae all right very important uh, native trees you can see those stipules at the base of the leaves right there and uh you know they can get actually quite large you know and they're 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 a weedy native all right pretty important pretty good for you know planting along the uh margins of a shitty river uh, you know, a feeder river, a toxic river, uh, if you're trying to get natives and stuff. So let's see what else they got going on. Okay, so we're here on, on this floating, this floating uh, bioswale, okay, this dock with uh, Nick and Phil from Urban River Association. You guys want to tell us what's going on? Why did you do this? Yeah, so basically we have these floating gardens. We put the plants on top, roots grow through, hang underneath, create fish habitat and other habitat, bring in a bunch of natives and really take these kind of existing sea walls and kind of the areas where you can't really have a natural edge and transform them into a sort of natural edge condition. So this is, it's like a basket that you fill with the, what, what do you fill with? Clay aggregate particles, you yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, just like little clay. So it's like an inner medium and it right. gets all its nutrients from the river itself. So it's pulling out a lot of those, uh, the excess nutrients that kind of flow through here. And nutrients them. and toxins, right? Nutrients you and said. toxins. But, and you said the, the river here is about, I don't know, six feet deep, but you got a lot of muck down there. You got like a lot of a lot of dirty stuff. Yeah, it was dug to like 18, and it just over time just has built up this fluffy mess of muck. And so the bottom condition is really not very great. And so, you know, being able to add some of these things and add some of the other habitat structures, we're really trying to bring back a, a similar context to... What a normal river is. But but basically we're stuck with the aquatics, right? I mean you wouldn't be planting prairie plants, so you gotta stick with, you know, riparian aquatic stuff. Yeah, if they're if they're planted like this where the roots are hanging down, they're yeah, all aquatics, yeah. When you guys started this, you were trying to plant food here originally, and then you you know, due to lead levels you you realized that might not be a good idea, and that's when you got into natives, right? Yeah, we did a um we did a test section with tomatoes, squash, kale, strawberries and Turns out it has uh, lead in the kale, and strawberries are delicious, but I don't think I'd serve them. Not in, surprising, you know. right? Because all that muck that's been, that's down there is probably very rich in, you know, the last 150 years of toxins. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, this whole river was basically either for shipping or sewage and dumping, so historically. So but, it was like a giant toilet for, you know, a century or two. Yeah, yeah, and, and really it's in the past, you know... 40, 50 years that that's really started to shift a lot and the use is changing and so it's like what do you do next with it? You know, do you keep it just this empty canal or do you try to find something that will really benefit the kind of people and wildlife who hang out here? Right, and so some people might be asking, you know, why do you want to do that? And, I, and to, you know, I would respond because, you know, it's nice, you know, during times when you feel like shit, you come down here, you spend some time with this stuff and it feels pretty good. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's not really many opportunities where you can get within nature in an urban environment and so this is kind of 
you know, its own little alien world where you could walk down and all of a sudden you see things like beavers and muskrats and, you know, different birds. So we got beavers coming back. This place is probably covered in pollen there. As I noticed, all that stuff over there is all hibiscus. That's the native Illinois hibiscus. Uh, you got uh, that the maple over there. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you notice you notice uh, insects and animals coming back, obviously, you know. And, and then, of course, you know, being that we evolved with this stuff, it feels good to be around it again. You, know, you could be... Oh, yeah. You know, maybe you come down here, you want to kill your boss, you know, and then, uh, you know, you see all this stuff and it makes you feel, a little, you know, maybe, maybe it gives your boss another day or two, you know? It takes the edge off, that's right. for sure. Yeah, right, yeah. So, it, when, so what's going on? So this stuff is like a floating mat. How, how thick is it? Yeah, so it's like about this thick. And basically, you know, the whole goal is that these plants grow through it. So we want to make sure that there's little impediments. So we have a little net that the roots can then hang, poke through and then hang down below and really create that structure that's that's missing all right and when when you know when you when you create so you're basically creating habitator so you get fish coming back you know obviously chonkosaurus the giant snappers hang out down there you saw them actually hatch recently or they laid eggs or what was yeah, going we on saw, we saw them breeding so we have some areas over there where basically we took a lot of these invasives and we sunk them into the water and created this kind of underwater habitat. so you pulled the invasives killed the invasive plants and used them as like uh is a uh, is habitat on the bottom like a like a aquatic duff exactly yeah yeah and so that's where one of the places there we're hanging out and you know making uh making more turtles right so did you have you guys seen you know eggs or uh little uh turtlings or anything yet or what i haven't seen them yeah, have you we did at the at the kayak chicago where you guys launched out of yesterday or a couple days ago um they go up there the they're looking for a gravelly spot to on land to lay their eggs and then those hatchlings hatch, they make their way to the water. We found one, it looked like a little half of a chestnut sitting there, I was looking down, I was like, what the heck is that? Hold on, that tiny little snapping turtle, like the big thing. You've seen a baby. Tiny, tiny. If we go down there to our logs, we see baby turtles all the time, baby snappers, baby red eared sliders, When When did you see things. the baby snapper? When that was would it? be 2018, and we got it on our social media too. Oh, so they've been here for a while. They're doing He's, their thing. Urban survivors, man. All these things, they find their way in the margins. Like I say, they reproduce in this. They, they want that gravelly. So, hey, we got a bunch of old gravelly parking lots. It's easy. It's a piece of cake for them. They get all the fish. They sit there. They wait for fish. They're herbivore. They can eat plants, too. All this kind of stuff. They're very generalist. That's the things that do well in urban environments and the things that can handle just about anything. So these na native animals are already doing well, and then now they're doing that much better since you've actually created a habitat and for them. And they're starting to help us take out some of the invasive stuff that we don't want to see. So uh, this winter, we found muskrats eating uh, zebra and quagga mussels. Oh, nice. Which were invasive uh, dressinids. Um, and then we've seen the beaver has started taking out some of these Siberian elms for us. Oh, nice. Which we get at the end of the dock. Which nice. Is a, a beautiful thing. It started off focusing on our pawpaws. Like, oh, hey, don't do that. <laughs> Put some fences or up around the stuff we want to protect. Everything else is free game for them. So, I'm so, so there's beavers on the Chicago River now, too. Tons of beavers. They, and this is, um, folks are surprised, but we got a lot of wildlife down here. Mostly because, like we're saying, it's river is really disconnected from the land you know they really find a home here there's not a lot of people bothering them um coyotes come by sometimes but if you're a goose you get a nice spot up land somebody comes by you fly into the water real quick it's kind of what they were missing in a lot of ways so this is a this is a haven for them naturally anyway so should we check out some of the stuff you guys got growing yeah let's go Okay, so what's what's this right here? What's this guy? That is uh, Calthopolustris. That's the marsh marigold. That's one of our first bloomers of the year. We've actually already have their flowers come out, and you can kind of see wrapping back up again after they've done their busy spot. They're important. We like to get all kinds of plants flowering at all times because all these pollinators are emerging. These bugs are emerging at the same time. They're hatching. They need diverse food types even early in the year. So we want to make sure that we're providing a little bit of everything for all stuff that might be trying to survive out here. And so this stuff, this is all hibiscus. I mean, that looks, that's got to look ins beautiful, we, like insanely beautiful when it's going off because those are large flowers, right? We, enormous flowers. We've got a couple different colors. It goes from basically like hot pink over to just cream white, beautiful flowers. Uh, this summer for the first time, we saw hummingbirds all over these things. They love that kind of... Hummingbirds on a Chicago river. Hummingbirds on a Chicago... Ruby-throated hummingbirds. Beautiful sight to see. 
uh, monarch butterflies. We got, like you guys identified, swamp milkweed in here. Um, monarchs come for miles around to stop by and hang out here. We've seen their caterpillars on some of our uh, monarch or uh, milkweed stocks. It's it's so a hot spot. So this is this is like a hotbed of activity of wildlife activity in a month or two. I mean, even now it kind of is. And, and yeah, from when you guys came to even today, we've had a couple of sunny days. Everything's popping off right now. You got uh, red-winged blackbirds over there. I can hear them. That's red, nice. Those red, are always pleasant. We, we've not seen those in a while, but they're back. Um, we found our uh, 100th and 101st bird species in a little uh, community event we had like last week. Um, so that was the yellow-bellied sapsucker. Um, and then the northern water thrush. We've seen a bald eagle over where you guys launched in the turning basin there. Um, all kinds of cool. You've seen stuff. a bald eagle on a, on a Chicago river. Bald eagle on the Chicago river. You it ever got see chased away by crows. You ever see ospreys or anything yet? Uh, down in the South Branch. Yeah, we, we saw that at the uh, Bubbly Creek Bio Blitz. Another similar situation, totally polluted bottom. Uh, they went out there, PhDs a long time ago went out there um, and took core sample and we're pulling up hooves and fur that were down there from years and years ago still. Jeez. So that's that's kind of, there's a couple of these spots. Oh, from the slaughterhouses. From the slaughterhouses, oh Bubbly Creek, that's notorious oh. for being the epicenter of that meatpacking industry. How did, how did somebody do this? Where'd the money come from? How long did it take? Who set it up, et cetera? Yeah. So we started working on it in like 2014, and then it took years just to get permits and everything like that to put it in. We did a Kickstarter, and then in 2017, we put the first installation in, and then just kind of kept growing after that. So a lot of grant funding, partnered with uh, Shed Aquarium, and then eventually the city got involved and basically had a grant from building tall buildings, and that was able to go towards this actual walkway section and building out the, the kind of first place you could to be in it instead of just kayaking. So this is something they could do all the way up the river, basically. Oh yeah. I mean. In my mind, this is a prototype for a solution that can happen on all urbanized water systems. So they all have pretty much the same general conditions. And so, you know, the hope is that in areas where you can't actually put naturalized edge, which if you can, you should, but in areas where you, you really can't do that. Because you got the steel retention walls. Yeah, because you got the steel walls, you got rules around how far you can go into the canal, all this stuff. That's where these really shine. And so connecting those ecosystems together you know in areas where you previously basically had no opportunity for that so what's, what was the cost of this total so this one here is about uh 1.4 million um, that's a lot of money to an individual but to to a city that's nothing it's a drop in a bucket yeah i mean it's you know it's cheaper than um you know buying land and doing something like this in, right. the, in an urban environment right and they might as well because i mean it's otherwise it's just empty anyway yeah you know? yeah exactly so this thing, this is Philopendula rubra, queen of the prairies, the common name, Rose family rosaceae. And how tall does this guy get? Tell everybody how tall that gets. That'll get probably about two, three feet, the pink, way we got them out here. Pink sprays of tiny flowers. Beautiful pink, like cotton candy looking flowers. Just probably covered in pollinators still. Covered in pollinators. And then you got this nightshade, this invasive uh, Solanum docamara. You gotta go and pull that out every once in a while. But you said, that used to not show up, right? Yeah, we, we didn't really get that out in force until like a year or two ago. Right. Probably because it's established on the bank right here. There you go, all right there. All that stuff yeah. just falls on all the time. But you just, you know, a couple couple years probably removing it. The natives out competed eventually. And Once we get to July and all these natives are filled in, there's no space for anything. So like this. July, August, this is like a thicket. You can't see the other side. You yeah. won't see the bottom. We won't see some of these plants again until the spring. So we got a, a native quote unquote weed. It's just a very aggressive native, you know, nothing can really be uh, you know, invasive if it's, if it's a native plant, of course, that's the wrong usage of the term, but impatience capensis, the jewel weed uh, can be very uh, aggressive. So sometimes they have to go in and pull that. But again, once this hibiscus comes back from those roots, which it should be, it'll, uh, should be soon, it'll, uh, it'll outcompete the impatience anyway and kind of shade it out. Look at this, you got a native, native aquatic carrot, Angelica purpurea. Look at that. When's the last time there was Angelica purpurea growing right here on the Chicago River? Probably, you know, 150, 200 years ago. Look at that. An aquatic carrot. Look at that old Asclepius. New one's going to be popping back up. Oh, you could see it. It's already popping back up right there. Probably Incarnata. Swamp milkweed. 
Okay, so when we were kayaking through her, we saw some mussel shells. Those are native mussels, native bivalves, basically. What's going on there? Yeah, that's uh, those are the ones that we want to see around here. That's Piganodon grandis, the giant floaters. Um, this bottom of this river here is not very friendly to a whole lot of mussels. But the one species of mussel that kind of do pretty well in almost any environment are those giant floaters. Um, their habitat is the only problem left. They got the oxygen they need. Water is generally clean enough. They got the food. Uh, they got the fish they need to reproduce. So all they kind of need is a nice comfy habitat. So as we come out here, one of the types of islands that we've got are these submerged kind of hanging baskets that allow us to put boxes of sand and things like that. That sand is that comfortable stuff that these mussels really like to burrow into. So fish can get up to them. They can continue that part of their reproductive life cycle, uh, but they're snug, they're safe. They're relatively healthy, except for whatever you saw got them, which is probably, you guys said seagull. I think it's probably a muskrat, uh -huh. very determined muskrat. You get the muskrats out here too. Oh, they love it. They love the plants in the winter time. They'll eat those invasive mussels. Um, so this one got a hold of one uh, adult. Uh, we've got probably 80 adults down in here right now. So what, what's the habitat they need? You said sand, like shallow waters and sand, basically. These, like you like you get historically on Illinois rivers. And this, like, natural river systems, you've got a little bit of everything, right? Like you've got fast current, rocky bottom, you've got slow current, silty bottom, you got uh, log jams, you got all this stuff. These guys like a slow current and they like a mucky bottom. Um, so they are kind of, this is the right spot for them. All we need to do is give them a little cleaner thing to burrow into because they are very sensitive to the environment, very the sensitive filter to pollution. Feeders, right? Filter feeders, right? Filter feeders. The reason these geese are flipping out right now is probably because of that egg. We don't know where that egg came from. It's it's one of theirs. They're right. not happy about it. But. You settled that. Why don't you guys go to a suburban retention pond somewhere, huh? So the geese... They could be uh, they could be problematic sometimes. You got to keep them off here with a the dog, they, right? They graze a lot. They graze a lot, and then when they're nesting, they sit down and they crush a whole circle of plants underneath. We get those bare spots. That's where the invasives come up. So they they're they're important parts of the ecosystem, right? They're they're generalists. They eat about everything. They're cycling nutrients. It's good that they're here. But we do want to, this is our place to protect these plants that have an even harder right. time. Also, it them. should be mentioned, you know, a native, a native species can be problematic if its population exists in, in a un, unnaturally high density due to lack of predators, et cetera. Plus, they would just be shitting all over the, all over the dock right here, too. We can't have that. <laughs> we got these guys, and it's literally just... So this is where you keep the mussels. Yeah, this is, this is a... Uh... Couple guys that we got um, three years ago, the DuPage County Ur uh, Forest Preserve. They've got an urban stream research center. We go out in the winter and we find pregnant females. We bring them over to them, and then we bring them back here after they've gotten to a certain size. So we got a couple different age classes. And of course, these are like air filters for the water. That's, these these are these guys are just rocks with guts. All they do is they live to clean water. You know that's their whole goal in life, and they don't move much. Um, they have a crazy reproductive cycle where they uh, they male spits out sperm in the winter, female takes it in, develops all these microscopic versions of themselves. This species puts those babies into a goo. They spit out the goo, and then a fish swims through that goo. Babies are cover the fish and then they're little vampires. They're sucking blood off of the fish until they get to a certain size. Hopefully an Asian carp. I ideally, but these guys are super generalists. They go for anything. They some don't of care. These, some of these fish are so specific. Some of these mussels have such a specific fish they need that they'll have their little foots that they dig with look like a fish of the a prey fish of the fish that they want to attract. Oh. They'll stick it out and they'll wiggle it around. Looks like they'll, the fish will swim up, nibble at it, and then it'll cough the babies into that fish's mouth. The so sly bastards with the hustle. That's right. <laughs> Definitely. So, como se dice ecosystem service is nice. That's right. So, could you, could you theoretically use these mussels to clean a river, basically? We, we, uh, we estimate, back in the napkin math, about 30,000 of these full adults would have enough filtration power to be pulling out all of the water that came through the canal at one point. Um, they're, they're big time filter feeders. A lot of what they do is they're pulling stuff, sediment, um, food, all this other stuff. They're pulling it out of the water, making that water more clear. 
and then they're depositing it into the benthic layer. They're pooping it into the bottom. So that is creating fertile places for submerged vegetation to grow up. That light can penetrate deeper, uh, really supporting those plants then will add oxygen to the water. And this is how natural river systems are cycling through nutrients and cycling through oxygen and things like it that. It kind of makes you wonder why aren't more cities doing this? I mean, this seems like it's so easy. You don't have to pay a bunch of guys to come in here, you know, on a float and clean stuff up or on a barge yeah. or anything. I mean, this is, this is what everybody should be doing and it's so easy too. Yeah, and th this is, you know, for us, this is very much a grassroots organization that the city uh, you know, we did something right and then they started to pay attention to it and then they started to support it. So it's just, it's a really hard startup cost. No one's going to really pay you very well to do this kind of stuff, especially when it's experimental. So everything that we do out here, we like to make sure it's backed by science. I'm our researcher. Uh, we've got two papers out right now. We're working on a couple more. Um, it's about reassuring people and demonstrating that this is definitely worth it. A lot of people forgot about cities for a while. Why are we doing stuff here when we can do stuff in a forest preserve and have a bigger impact? This is where people are. This is so. where it needs it the most, man. This, this is this. So is, you could this with theoretically with more funny, you could do this shit all up and down the river. Yeah, there's there's no there's there's better places to do it. There's worse places to do it. There's other decisions that you want to make, but this is a key piece to activating a lot of these really tough places for this stuff to exist. And you're not going to get rid of the seawall, but what you can do add the plants back. They're the primary drivers of the ecosystem. They're the ones doing half of this stuff. So if you build it, they will come. That's right. So this makes sense on a practical level, but also just on a, you know, bringing nature back to the city level. And bringing people to the nature. You right, know, that's, exactly. A lot of folks can't get out to a national park or a state park or anything like that. People can't always go hiking. People can't always go. This is where it's accessible to folks. So right. this, is, this is an important part in city of Chicago a lot of people live near the river. Some people have never been on it, and that's something that we, we don't want to have happen anymore. So this, so this kind of solves the problem of that inaccessibility and disconnection from these things that inhabited these areas for so long that's anyway. Right. Yep. So part of what's nice about planting natives, right, especially when they do well, they, when they do well really easily because they evolved here, is that then you have seed stock. I just pulled all these seeds out of this, uh, this native hibiscus, and each one of those little uh, fruits, remember fruit's just an ovary, uh, has a, you know, up to 100 or 200 seeds in it. So you guys, are, you, guys, you guys got a lot of seed out of here, obviously. Oh yeah, we've got whole, three whole trash bags full of, and that was just us taking half of everything that's out here. We use these in our seed bombs, so when schools come over, uh, kids, we basically have them roll these seeds up with some clay and some soil, they get a, a balloon, water balloon launcher, and we launch them into the river. And those little balls, hopefully someday, yeah, I, was, I was gonna say, float man, down and deposit themselves in a fun area where hopefully these guys, especially this hibiscus, they're survivors, man. They can handle this urban environment. I, mean, I, I was gonna say because I've seen these growing. No one planted them on the shitty I and M canal, you know, where it <laughs> smells right. right across from the sewage plant. I mean, the, just what you would think is toxic water, and there's native Illinois hibiscus. You know just growing on the banks yeah, so and their, their seeds are perfectly evolved for this environment too they just get in the water they float down somewhere they deposit themselves just a little bit of soil is all they need off to the races their stalks are keeping geese off their hard stems kind of prevent all this herbivory they are perfectly designed to deal with a lot of this not to mention the flower is the size of a fucking grapefruit too <laughs> that helps a lot so you know it's only a matter of years before you end up getting them down there so you guys were, you know, originally growing food, which is, you know, that's cool if you're doing it in your backyard, but you don't want to be doing food on the river. But also, it's more of kind of like an anthropocentric way to look at things, and we're trying to actually bring the ecosystem back and stuff. So what happened with that? Yeah, so we had probably about, in our first installation, about 50 or 55 platforms, individual little rectangles that we had to work with. So we... I, we were really pushing, hey, heavily natives, but let's also try that food piece. Because like you're saying, that's everyone thinks with their stomach. And usually when we tell somebody about an invasive species, their first question is, can we eat it? That's like our solution <laughs> to a whole lot of stuff. Right. So we said, okay, put some food crops out. We tried uh, just from the Home Depot down the block. Uh, we tried some spinach, some kale, some tomatoes, some strawberries, squash, all this stuff. We took it over to a food testing lab, Diabol Labs. Um, did some heavy metal analysis on it, founding that the leafy greens were pulling up 
significant amounts of lead. Not not exactly. Yeah, I was gonna say you, you couldn't pay me fifty bucks to eat something that came out of this river. No offense to the river, but well, and that's some of our co-founders had a little more liberal ideas about food sanitation, but. Uh, yeah, a lot of people would probably agree with you. We, look, we looked at that and just the, you know, this space is so much more valuable to put natives in and we just... So you were kind of happy the food thing didn't pan out because then that means, okay, we just get to focus on fucking natives now. What are we going to try next? What right. kind of room X do we want to put out there in its place? So we've seen a bunch of foam when we were out here on the river, you know, artificial yellow foam. Tell us where that came from. Uh, it's the most Chicago of sources. There's the old Vienna beef factory up on the river a bit north there. Uh, they were taking out some uh, air ducts up top. They were cutting off his pieces of roofing. They must have left it around somewhere. Strong storm came through, blew it all, and a bunch of people's parking lots and everything. You know, river's the lowest point in the landscape. Everything up ends up in the river. So you guys been seeing that foam come through for a while. Our, our volunteers have pulled out probably four dumpsters full of that stuff. Holy so. shit. So I don't know, where could people volunteer if they want to get involved? How, what do they do? Come to us. Come to Urban Rivers. Or check out our website. We've got our volunteer program, the River Rangers. We get you out in kayaks. We get you out picking up stuff. We get you out looking at birds and turtles and all that good stuff. We got you know, something for everybody. You put them out there in the kayaks for free. That's right. Yes, free. All you got to do is get a little dirty, get a little stinky. People in Chicago love free stuff. <laughs> Who doesn't? So we just seen a giant Asian carp over here, but do you see any native fish ever? Uh, we see mostly native fish. And this is a cool thing about fish where you find natives, you don't find so many invasives. Where you find invasives, you don't find so many natives. So we've got probably 23 species that we see regularly in the canal here. Um, in the wider river, it's kind of a bit bigger. Um, 23 uh, probably about five six seven of those being invasive so that common carp is originally invasive just like asian carp same story they're used to clean up uh wastewater ponds and things like that flooded got into the river system uh but these guys have been around here a pretty long time so they're generally naturalized they thrive but you in. said you've seen some guy pull a catfish out of here two two and a half pound channel catfish just right over there um we've seen bat pretty sizable largemouth bass coming out of here um, and these are all native fish. All native fish. Uh, perch, crappie, a lot of bluegills, a lot of pumpkin seed, all that kind of in stuff. This, in this water? In this water. I mean, it's it doesn't look all that great, but believe me, there's a, there's a lot more uh, chemistry, there's a lot more habitat here than you might imagine. And that's just without us trying. Imagine if we tried throughout this entire river system. They're able to endure. That's right. What about the ducks? The ducks never give you any trouble, do they? The ducks are the kindest souls. Look at them. They're so mellow. They're so nice. Just you know? out. Well, Phil, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate it. Well, we appreciate yeah. you guys coming by. Look, they got a native verbena. Okay, order Lamiali's, you know, right, sage order. All right, verbena hastata. Look at that. It's the old. It's going to be coming back soon. Lit up blue, blue flowers. And look at that shit over there. Just little floating, floating aquatic habitat. Anybody could do this. You can start doing this gorilla style. All right, without any funning. Just, you know, get some of that netting. Fill it with the aggregate or the hay. They got hay down here and stuff too. And just see what works. Test it out. You're not going to know until you just start doing it. Anybody could do this stuff. You know, you live on a river. You know, you get tired of that smell. You could start creating habitat. Watch it come back. Slowly clean up. Anyway, that's all I got for you today. Have a good rest of your afternoon. Go fuck yourself. Bye.